finishing chapter six, the gardens of Adonis. Adonis, Adonis, one of those two. We began with the idea of domestication, which is something we learn about a lot in archeology. span We love domestication in archeology, span correct? Yes. Anyway, it's actually difficult to define domestication. We're gonna talk about it in terms of plants for a little bit. With animals, it's even trickier sometimes. But what Graver Weingrove says is one of the key elements of domestication is the element of seed dispersal. So how do you, how do you, how does a plant get its seeds out into the wild? Now, in non-domesticated varieties, you're trying to disperse your seeds far and wide, get them out into the wind, get them out there as far as you can so you'll have better chances of reproducing if you are a plant, which we're not plants. But when we have domestication, what we see is it relies upon certain sets of genetic mutations, which in the case of something like wheat, helps the seeds stay close to home because we humans need those seeds and we need them to grow into bigger kernels of things so we can eat them and also save the seeds for later. We don't want the seeds going everywhere. So it helps if there's a helpful genetic mutation that aids this process along, which turns the plant, Graver Grove put it, from a hardy survivor into a hapless dependent. So if you take these plants that have been domesticated and you put them back out into the wild, they become dependent. They become stupid and they can't reproduce themselves without the help of human beings. And so almost all definitions of domestication, whether it be plant or animal, rest on some kind of notion of human control over the process. Humans being in command or making sure that everything is all right, making sure that the plant is submitting to our control so that it will be a hapless dependent upon us. Now, particularly with the case of wheat, which is the classic domesticate, right? I mean, especially, I guess, because we live in, we are, we are the inheritors of our Euro, Euro-American tradition and we really love wheat. Corn is actually much more difficult to figure out how people ever domesticated corn. But wheat seems easy because there were certain genetic mutations which made the seeds more accessible to us and it became a hapless dependent. But some archeologists and some botanists and some historians like to turn this question on its head and say, well, are, is, wheat, are, is wheat a hapless dependent upon us? Or is, did wheat actually make us into its hapless dependence? Because we depend upon wheat so much or other things like rice or corn or potatoes, that we submit to all of their demands in order to produce more and more of them. And they give an example from the book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, which has been a huge bestseller. He's like the Jared Diamond of today now. Took a lot from Jared Diamond as well. Borrowed a lot of things, but turned it into this historian thing by Harari. We've seen Harari before. Harari was the one who compared human societies to bonobo groups and chimpanzee groups back in the day. But I'd like to just kind of highlight here how much, in some ways, Graber and Wengro's book is written against these big accounts like Harari and, uh, and Jared Diamond and these kind of all-scope history of humankind things. Now, so Harari claims that, you know, because we started planting wheat, then all of a sudden we have to dig the earth and then we have to put up fences and we have to make wheat happy. And so that it spreads itself all over the world and we're now at the mercy of wheat. And Graeber and Wengro say that it is true that there are some species that kind of domesticate themselves, dogs and mice and things kind of come into human 
habitations and make themselves friendly. Maybe dogs, I guess, are the classic example of an animal that has has thrived from making itself look nice to us and being less wolf-like and being more dog-like and reading our emotions. They're very clever, those dogs. And so they kind of probably snuck in there and realized that it was a good idea to hang out with humans. I guess mice aren't really domesticated, but they certainly hang out with us a lot. Everywhere we go, they go too. So there's some species that come in and kind of domesticate themselves, but wheat is not one of them because definitely it's a plant that can't mirror our emotions. They also say that it is true in the long run, of course, we are sort of dependent on our crops and we do a lot for them today. That is true. But in terms of Neolithic farmers, Gabe, what would you say about this story? It's a weird fairy tale to tell. And in fact, we know it well because it, it sort of echoes something we've heard a long time ago in the Bible. <laughs> so the story of the Bible, the fall of the Garden of Eden. And so they say, wait a second. From certainly maybe from our viewpoint, wheat has spread all over the world. But for the first farmers, this doesn't make any sense. Like they weren't really dependent upon the, the wheat. And the reason they, one of the reasons they cite for this is because if you look at the genetic mutations and experimentally, that it's calculated that the early farmers could have made wheat perfectly domesticated in at most 200 years. And probably, fewer years than that. It probably would have taken just a few cycles, maybe 20 or 30 years, but at most 200 years, simply by sorting out the good, what we would determine were the good plants from the bad. I mean, they weren't necessarily doing, doing ex well, it was a form of experimentation. So you just gather the plants that you want and you discard the ones that you don't, or they blow away anyway, because their seeds don't have the same genetic mutation. And eventually you have your completely domesticated wheat. So we should, or people, humans, should have been able to do this in, in at most 200 years. However, Gabe, how long did it actually take before you have fully domesticated farms and stuff like that? It's like thousands. Yeah, the actual number is about 3,000 years between, you know, being able to start manipulating these plants and dealing with them and actually coming in and, you know, having this fully on, full on domestication farm field relationship that we know so well today. So to call this, to call a 3,000 year process of stops and starts, we've referred to this in archaeology often as the agricultural revolution. People refer to this as some sort of revolution. But revolution should not take 3,000 years. If it, was, if it were truly revolutionary, people would have realized this uh, pretty early on and sort of submitted their, or got this process started much earlier. We were certainly, people were certainly capable of this, but they didn't really want to do it, it turns out. In fact, they may, they may honestly have not wanted to do it at all. What are the challenges? Why might people not want to domesticate and grow wheat and rice and all these things at the scale that we see in later generations? Why might we might not want to farm so much? Why don't, why haven't you started your next paper yet? I know, this is, is it due tomorrow? That is a good question. Is it due tomorrow? 
And I would ar argue that that's the same reason for the challenges of farming. What are the challenges? Of, well, you don't have the topics yet, but why don't you want to start it? Yeah, Cyrus. Well, what if I want to feed myself, though? Yeah, there's no need for it, but why don't I want to do it, Gabe? It's commitment, man. It's hard work. How many people have done some serious farming? Yeah, is it easy? No, <laughs> farming is hard. Farming sucks, I hate to tell you. It's hard work, right? And as Graver and Wengrove put it, it interferes with other stuff we want to do, like hunting, maybe we like hunting more, like collecting wild foods, like producing, like, you know, weaving and, pottery, important things like marriages. And they also say it interferes with a bunch of other stuff like gambling, storytelling, traveling around. Hard to be hard to, hard to travel and be a farmer at the same time. Farmers don't really travel too much, you know. And organizing masquerades, also difficult to do when you're a farmer. I guess maybe that's something you might do in the off season anyway. So hard work to farm. Felicia, how are we going to solve this hard work problem of farming? <laughs> Flood retreat. Flood retreat. We're going to, this is a picture from the Mekong Delta. I'm not sure that they were doing this exactly, but it's the best picture that I could come up with for flood retreat farming, which is practiced in many different parts of the world. And we're going to bring it back. What are the advantages, Felicia, of flood retreat farming? Why do we like it so much? It brings water for the yeah. farm. It does. Yeah. Nature brings it to us. We don't have to go out there with a hose or dig a ditch or do anything. Well, we might dig a little ditch and kind of move the water around a little bit to where we want to go. But it's like a little bit of work because it's going to flood anyway. So it's, you know, nature's doing the work. And of course, well, I mean, they say that you don't have to have like a central manager. In some of these irrigation systems, you have pretty strict control over who gets what. Um, and one of the other interesting things about it is, as you can see here, when we usually think of a farm, what do we usually think of? Like, what's the picture we have in our head of a farm? Huh? Yeah, but like, what, what does it look like from a distance? You know, you're looking out onto a farm, huh? Grain, yeah. Does anybody picture, yeah, Gabe, what are you thinking about? It's like little plots and there's like lines, right? and fences, right? And like making sure everybody's on their own plot of land and I got my little house out in the middle of that land. The thing about flood retreat farming is the land's always changing around. It's shifting around. And so you can't measure it. You can't put a fence up. It's just gonna get taken down. You can't really privatize it because it might be different next year. I can't put a fence up here. Look at that. Very difficult to fence that in. So what they say is that flood retreat farming tends toward less toward private holdings and more toward collective holdings or being flexible. And this is what they seem to have been doing, as Matt told us in the last class at Chitalia, was this sort of flood retreat thing where you let the waters come in and then they recede. Liz, you found this to be true even in a different class, bringing a different class and a whole different paper into this class. Where else did they use flood retreat farming? Those clever Egyptians using flood retreat farming on the Nile River. So again, we see this in many different parts of the world. Of course, today we're often trying to prevent floods, but it turns out we can we can use them or we could have used them in a better way. 
Raven Wengro emphasized that what seems to have been happening here was that women, especially women, were starting to experiment with plant-based knowledge. Well, they speculate that it was probably women. And the reason they do this is they say that when you survey in the ethnographic present, who is working with the plants? The plant-based knowledge is almost always gendered women in most anthropological accounts. They say it's almost an anthropological universal. And as you may know by now, there are very few things that are an anthropological universal. Anthropologists are famous at trying to tear down any universals. If somebody tries to say that something is universal, ah, everybody is violent, we go and find the peaceful people. If we try to say everybody is peaceful, we go and find the violent people. So we usually say that there's nothing universal. And there are a lot of gendered things that, you know, that are said to be universal in one society. An anthropologists will find another society and find out that there the men do it and here the women do it. And over in this other society, women do the same task and they say exactly that it's biological or universal. Anyway, this one, though, seems to be pretty close to an anthropological universal, which is why they speculate that the women were doing this back in the day. The plants were important, not necessarily just for the food, but also for the fibers and making things like textiles and weaving baskets and mats. We mats as in mats on the floor and on things that you wear. So, uh, you know, and people uh, got this from a research article that was trying to figure out how you have to reconstruct. It's hard, to, it's difficult archaeologically because these things fade away faster than other artifacts and so oftentimes you have to find them based on like imprints on the floor because over time these things will go away so they're trying to reconstruct the techniques of these things maybe from pottery uh, and seeing how people might have woven them but you can see here what kind of skills would you need to be able to make this kind of thing? In addition to just having dexterous hands and being able to figure that out, what would you need? Yeah, so, huh? Well, yeah, you'd need to have all kinds of things to be able to mix paints and dyes and be able to figure that one out. Yeah. What does this look like to you? What elementary skill schools school skills would you need to figure this one out? Maybe high school skills. The science of shapes. <laughs> yeah, some geometry, do a little math, maybe a little calculation. Maybe you want to play checkers on that board. They claim that this leads to ideas about, you know, figuring out shapes and where they align and how to make things make shapes and the mathematical stuff that people were experimenting with soils and clays and making things out of them and using the fibers for how for the for housing and those kinds of things all throughout the houses. So they say that what we need to do is get away from the idea that everything about plants were was the domestication as in control of the plants and farming and move toward thinking about this as botany and gardening. So the, especially the women in these societies were experimenting with these different ideas and mixing things up in order to get cool stuff to grow and to weave and to wear and to put on your floors and walls and those kinds of things. They talk about this also in terms of the clay models. Those figurines and other things. And they say that these are good for helping us solve problems. That they represent relationships, that they're little tokens of things that you can pass back into back and forth within and between groups. And so they say that in fact, what we have going on here is not perhaps not so much an 
agricultural revolution as a media revolution, which you usually don't. This is kind of an unusual. I was trying to think about this. It's not, not what you would usually think about when you think about soils and clays and textiles and plants and domestication, that it's transforming the way people are representing things and having ideas about them and thinking about what's going on. So they say that this is mostly going on in the what they call the lowlands or the lowlands of the Fertile Crescent. Meanwhile, up in the highlands, there's some different stuff going on up in those highlands where we have around Gobekli Tepe and the Ufra Valley, we have another site, Kagoni Tepesi and the House of Skulls. And Matt was supposed to talk about this with us, but he didn't come to class today, other Matt. The House of Skulls, for the simple reason that it was found to hold the remains of over 450 people. This is page 243. Including headless corpses and over 90 crania, all crammed into small compartments. Cervical vertebrae were attached to some skulls, indicating they were severed from fleshed, but not necessarily living bodies. Most of the heads were taken from young adults or adolescents, individuals in the prime of life, and 10 from children. The skulls were left bare with no trace of decoration. What does this make you think? <laughs> we're, we're talking about the burial practice most of the heads were taken from young adults or adolescents individuals in the prime of life what the heck is going on here doesn't sound like huh if you found a house with a bunch of skulls in it, including people who were seemed to be in the prime of their life, what would you do? Huh? <laughs> yeah, you'd okay. probably better get the hell out of there. Right? This is crazy, man. They seem to be very engaged in the same thing that happened to Gobekli Tepe. They seem to be very engaged in various chopping heads. Now, we're not sure if this is all in living. They might have been dead already. But it seems to be related to this idea. Remember that hunting is very big in these highland areas. That hunting was a form of predation. And it seems like this was also practices. Basically, trophy heads on getting them from human beings and your enemies. Just not very nice at all. The reason I was going to pick on the other Matt is he said that it showed respect for tradition and your ancestors and all those kinds of things. And that's why I had to read all that because it doesn't sound like that to me. Sounds pretty yuck. Sounds pretty much like they were going out and being mean to other people and getting their heads and collecting them. And yeah, they should have been reported. In fact, what happens to that house, the skull, the house of skulls, the House of Skulls met its end in a violent conflagration, a big fire, after which the people of Koyuni, Koyuni covered the whole complex under a deep blanket of pebbles and soil. Now maybe that was their version of reporting these guys as they burned the house down and covered it up so that nobody could do it again. Matt found a different form of skulls, though, that was going on in the lowlands. Kind of weird too, but different. Why? What were they doing? Yeah. Now, this doesn't, I don't like this either. It's kind of yucky too, but it's very different, right? It's a very different thing than just exhibiting all these bare skulls in one place. They take them out from burials, paint, plaster over them, put shells in their eyes. This is a 
This is called, this is actually apparently the most famous one. It's called the Jericho skull. You have to go to the British Museum, though, to see it. I don't know how the Brits got that. Why are you shaking your head, Gay? You hate the British Museum. Yeah, I guess lately they've been trying to reconstruct what that person under the skull portrait might have looked like. So there they go. <laughs> the Brits. Yeah, they took a lot of stuff. A lot of good stuff there. But at least you can just go there and see it. How'd they get from that to that? From Jericho to London or from the... Oh, well, it was complicated. You know, you don't want to mess with it too much. Or... No, they use computers and stuff. There's a whole article about this. You can you can look it up how they they tried. I mean, there's a little bit of that. You have to use your imagination, but you do some probably some some sonar. You look inside and try and figure out what the skeleton was like, and then you reconstruct. There you go. Anyway. <laughs> what Graver and Wengro want to persuade us of is that this was a process, which we've heard of before, of schismogenesis, where you have the uplanders doing their trophy head, hunting, predation, violent, hierarchical stuff. And you have the lowlanders who are still doing strange stuff with skulls. It's not like you need to do this to be nice to your ancestors. There's a bunch of different ways you can be nice to your ancestors. You have the lowlanders, which are doing weird stuff with skulls, but it's kind of an opposite. It's kind of an opposition to what the uplanders were doing. And remember that these two areas were very linked together by trade and interconnection, but there seems to have been different stuff going on. So we then get to the big, the big conclusion or the big, the big point about all this starting with a quote from David Clark, who apparently was a very famous, back in the 1970s, they say, a brilliant, brilliant Cambridge archaeologist called David Clark. Another David. Apparently only the brilliant people are Davids predicted that with modern research, almost every aspect of the old edifice of human evolution may in perspective emerge as semantic snares and metaphysical mirages. Those are some big words. Semantic snares and metaphysical mirages. Looked up, David Clark. Whoops. Hey. There he is. Man, the poor guy. He was born in 1937 and died in 1976 at age 38 only. Now that seems old to you, but to me, I'm like, oh my gosh. Prime of his life. Apparently he was super brilliant. He was like a nice guy and brilliant and came up with all these great ideas. But man, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't like David Graeber, I guess, also not too old, passed away. Anyway, when we get, you never want to get caught in a semantic snare, because that sucks. And definitely a metaphysical mirage would also be something to be avoided. I think what he's talking about is that we like to see things that sort of these events that changed everything, right? The agricultural revolution. And we like to say, aha, we've got it. We're going to look for this back in archaeology. But in fact, Felicia, do we see a big dramatic shift between the people who were hunting and gathering and the people who were farming? Uh, <clears throat> um, they say that they're not too, they are not too unique and completely different groups. Rather, they exist like they are the same group of individuals, but they use various organization at a different time. Yeah. So what we don't see is this agricultural revolution. There's not this sudden like, aha, I was hunting once and now I'm a farmer. Now I'm just plowing it up because farming is so much better than 
gathering or hunting. What we see instead, we don't see the switch. We see people adding on farming, adding on herding, continuing to hunt, continuing to fish. Don't forget about the fishing. And doing this at different seasonal times, so coming in and out of different seasonal organizations, as we've talked about, in different ways. Now, as we've discussed, in that fertile crescent in the highlands, in the uplands, up where we have that house of skulls and stuff, that's the least agricultural area, the least farming, and that's where we see the most in terms of hierarchy, stratification, and violence. Which, if you remember, in the traditional story, stratification and violence come to us from agriculture, whereas up here in the uplands, which seem to be the most dependent on hunting and gathering, that's where you see this stratification and violence. Whereas in the lowland Fertile Crescent, those areas where they're doing the skull portraits, which is having the most domesticated crops and the most farming, we see women coming to the fore. We see pretty much egalitarian, I mean, not absolutely, but in contrast to the highlands, we don't see the same form of trophy hunting and stratification that we see in the upland. Now, Graeber and Wengro say that this raises, you ready, Cyrus? They say that this raises an obvious question. What is so obviously questionable about this? What's the obvious question? Go back, make sure our Cyrus has this all written down. Oh, oh, yeah. Those two lines. You have the upland fertile crescent, where you have least agriculture, least domestication. It's a land of hunting, gathering, stratification, and violence. You have the lowland fertile crescent, where you have more domestication, more agriculture, and there it's more egalitarian chilled out a little bit more. And they have egalitarian gardening. Now, what is the obvious question? Huh? Why? Well, we'll never know why. Why? You can never know why. <laughs> Why can't we ever know why? Why can't we ever know why? Because why is a kind of an ultimate question, which in the, in the history and social sciences, there's so much that happens at random that you can't ever know why. But let's put it this way. We depend on farming and we see later societies that depend on farming get very hierarchical and very violent, right? Warfare and all those things. And yet here, we see what seems to be the opposite emerge. So the obvious question, according to Gregor Wengro, if the adoption of farming actually set humanity or some small part of it on a course away from violent domination, what went wrong? 